Meet CBS2 news anchor and reporter Christine Johnson, next on a special edition of Carpe Diem. Hello, welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Mark Rosenwig, Associate Professor in the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Our guest is Christine Johnson, co-anchor of the 5 and 11 p.m. news at CBS2 in New York. She's an award-winning journalist who's equally at home, both behind the anchor desk and reporting from the field. She's covered the devastation of Superstorm Sandy, the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary, and the Boston Marathon bombings. Prior to joining CBS2 News, Christine was an anchor at MSNBC and also anchored for NBC's Early Today and Weekend Today show, and she worked at WPRI-TV in Providence for a decade before coming to New York. She's also the mother of two children, and she's here today to receive our Alan B. Dumont Broadcaster of the Year Award and to speak with students. And Christine, welcome and congratulations on the award. Oh, thank you so much. I'm humbled, actually, to be invited here today and to be recognized. Well, it's a pleasure to, to meet you. And I want to start out by asking you how you got interested in broadcast journalism. How early did you get the bug and, and how did it start? It's so funny that you say, did you get the bug? Because that's exactly really how it starts. Mm -hmm. um, it was my freshman year in college. I attended the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. I entered just under the general studies program, not really sure where my path was going to lead me. And I was sitting in my dorm room, second semester of my freshman year, and of course I had the TV on in the background as I'm <laughs> supposed to be studying. And I heard like this dun dun dun, and it was a special open to a special report on C the CBS News, and it was Dan Rather um, announcing that uh, Operation Desert Shield was then turning into Operation Desert Storm. And you know the it, the whole controversy and the action and just the here and the now of everything. I was mesmerized. And I thought, wow, what a powerful tool this is. Not only is it a tool to inform the viewers, but it's also a huge responsibility because you want to make sure that what you're telling the viewers is fact and it's fair. And that was the night. It was all over for me. And I remember following up uh, the very next day with the journalism program at my school, asking questions, figuring out if this is really something that I wanted. And after visiting with a few professors, the rest is history, as they say. And you must have had some professors who were mentors there, right, who oh. uh, got you started? Yes, and it's funny, um, in hindsight, my relationship with them now and how the tables have somewhat turned because when I was their student, and I still consider them, I still consider myself their student, but I was, I had a lot of admiration for them. I still have a lot of admiration for them. And I swear, you know, I looked up to them with, uh, with respect. And since I've been in touch with them recently, my university invited me back for an alumni award. And my former professor and advisor is now at Syracuse University. And for them to now look at me, you know, with respect and admiration, and just as somebody to be really proud of is really humbling. It's really humbling. Now take us on the next step of the journey because you go from there, what, to Providence or was there an intermediate stop? No, you know what? Um, it was one of those uh, personal situations where um, my now husband was living in, in, in Rhode Island. He's over there someplace. Yeah, We're yes, pleased to meet him today. He's still supporting here with me after all these years. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, he, you know, it was on a whim, really. And I thought, well, I'll try to get a job out there. Let's see, let's see where this brings me. And um, I answered an ad in the, wanted, the Help Wanted section of the Providence Journal. They were looking for a part-time assignment editor at WPRI in Providence. And I thought, well, you know what? It's a foot in the door. Let me check this out. Let's see where this leads. And thankfully, my internship that I had just left in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, the assignment editor there gave me a glowing recommendation, which was very nice and generous of him. And I got the job. And um, 
it wasn't the position, you know, that I ultimately longed for, but I thought to myself, you know what, it's a start, it's a beginning, and let's just start well, isn't from that here. Well, isn't that a message for students, too, that you might have to take what we would say is a, a crappy job or, or a lesser job than you want to get started and maybe sacrifice your 20s to get going? Oh, most, most definitely, and it's something that I always tell interns, you know, in my newsroom today when they come into my office and ask for advice and that is you need to allow yourself to take on positions and responsibilities that maybe you don't find very attractive and you know what being an assignment editor is a very very important job in a newsroom the newsroom centers around the information that you are giving out and there's a lot of um, organization that is involved there but my goal was to always be on camera but being an assignment editor gave me a lot of respect for the people that do that job and it also gave me a better understanding of how the newsroom operates so now I feel as though having that makes me a better reporter and a better anchor as a result and then you gradually work your way up within that station. How, did, did. That, how did that I, happen? You know, and and I, how, long did it, how long did it take to get to the spot you wanted to be, and how did that happen? Well, I started um, out, as I just mentioned, as a part-time assignment editor, and when I left there 10 years later, I was anchoring the 10 o'clock news. Mm -hmm. And it was a journey. It didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of hard work. I worked weekends. I worked holidays. I worked overtime. Whenever they needed me, I made myself available. And I just showed that I had perseverance, that I wasn't scared to put in the extra hours. And the days that I did have off, I would beg the photographers <laughs> to go out and shoot stand-ups with me and buy them a coffee afterwards just to say thank you. And I would keep reporters raw tapes, as we used to say back in the day. And um, I would then put together my own packages and add in my own stand-up into those, into those packages. And then every so often go knock on my news director's door and say, hey, you know what, do you mind taking a look at this? Give me your feedback, what do you think? That way it was just a gentle reminder like, okay, I'm on the assignment desk right now, or maybe I'm a writer right now, or I'm an assistant producer right now, and then eventually I was producing. Um, just little gentle reminders like, yes, I'm going through the motions here. I'm taking on all these responsibilities behind the scenes, but eventually my goal is to be in front of the camera. And that um, opportunity came one day after a lot of just persistence on my part. And uh, I think I, pro prove, I, I, I had to prove myself, and I think I did that. And the day that I was given that opportunity, um, I made sure that I didn't fall on my face. So <laughs> well, yeah, you spent a lot of time working to prepare, and that's, I did. that's the key word, is being prepared. Right? I did. And to be honest, there were days that um, I, I was broken. I thought, you know what, this is not going to work out. I'm never going to you know, get in front of the camera. Um, it's, it, maybe this just isn't meant to be for me. And I would go home. I would be upset. I would be depressed. And then the next morning, I say, you know what, it's a new day. Let's go at this again. And thankfully I did. Thankfully I didn't give up. And then you get to uh, MSNBC. How did, how did that all oh, happen? That yeah. was like out of the blue. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of, uh, there's tactics, you know, that go on with these networks. Mm -hmm. And thankfully in Providence, um, we started to build a really good brand at the station that I was at. It was, a, it was an ABC affiliate when I was first hired and then we quickly moved over to a CBS affiliate. So the majority of the time that I was there, we were a CBS affiliate. The number one station in the market was always WJR, which is an NBC affiliate in Providence. And they have been the news leader in that market forever. And finally, we were giving them a run for, for their numbers, so to speak. And um, I think at times, NBC kind of looks at the market overall and says, hmm, who are these people in this market that are, that, are, that are challenging <laughs> my network here? Happen, yes. Yeah, and um, in all honesty, that's how it happened. I got the call from, from NBC saying, hey, you know, would you be interested in maybe possibly going to, you know, to this uh, station that we have, you know, in this particular town or whatever? 
And um, I started to explore that opportunity and then other ones came my way and eventually I ended up at MSNBC. It was um, a whirlwind couple of months and I can't tell you, you know, I was anchoring a, a, you know, a, a major newscast in Providence and I thought to myself, wow, you know what, I'm pretty accomplished. When I got to MB MSNBC, I was like, ooh, <laughs> I've got a lot to learn. <laughs> this is a whole but, different ballgame. But you recognized that quickly, so you, I'm sure you did a quick study and, oh, uh, and, yeah. and learned, right? And you know what, I told myself, don't be afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, this is all unfamiliar territory to you. When I say it's apples and oranges, it's apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. And I just said to myself, you know what, put on the brakes here. You need to figure out how this process works mm -hmm. at this level. Mm -hmm. And I did, and I'm not gonna lie, I stumbled, I stumbled. But I always tried to make my recovery more memorable. Now you have a, a Filipino mother and a, a Swedish American dad, yeah. and, and your husband is here too. How important has family support been to you over the years? And, in developing both professionally and, and personally? I couldn't do it without it. Mm -hmm. There's no way. This is a very demanding business. Mm -hmm. As I, you know, there are other um, industries out there that are just as demanding, but this one is demanding. It's, it's demanding of your personal time because you know what? The news is a 24 7 operation. It doesn't take a break on holidays and it doesn't take a break on weekends. And when there is a major news event happening, you're not at home watching it unfold on TV. You're in the newsroom. It's all hands on deck. So if I did not have that family support, I couldn't do this. And thankfully, my husband, who was, you know, who I was dating in college, um, recognized that, you know what, you know, she does have something in her that I think that she can make a go of this business. And he's always been very steadfast. And you know, he had to move here to this area with me when I got the job at MSNBC. So, and then my mom and dad, you know, there have been times that I've had to call in the reinforcement, so to speak, because my husband works full time too. He has a very demanding job, a very important job. And um, mom and dad have always been there to help me and my brothers and sisters. But at the same time, they also keep me grounded, <laughs> which is so That's important. That's good. No, we, we all need that. Yeah, we, they, we really do. And, and how do you juggle everything with, uh, you have two young children, yeah. and you're, you know, you're up till at least midnight because you're on the 11 o'clock news. How do, you, uh, how do you parent with them? How do you work yeah, that out? Um, you know, it's, it's a constant juggle. Some days are obviously easier than others. I've been very fortunate to find some very great people to help me take care of my children. And um, my husband does more than his fair share as well at the house. But the lack of sleep is mm -hmm. what really is the hardest part of what I do. I get home usually between, you know, 12.15 and 12.30 in the morning after mm -hmm. my 11 o'clock broadcast. And I try to be in bed by one. I try my best to be in bed, my head on the pillow, <laughs> eyes closed at one o'clock. It's tough because you are wound up. Yeah, you, you are a yeah. bit wound up. Yeah. Um, but I also need to remind myself that I have to be up at 6.30ish in the morning, you know, to get my kids ready for school and get them fed and get their lunches packed and drive them to their, to their school. Um, so, you know, getting that amount of sleep every day is, it's taxing, but I love my family, I love my job, and for now it works. But when the day comes that it doesn't work, I will have to, you know, make those adjustments. Do you want your children to be journalists? Oh. Uh, have once, you thought about that at all? You know, once in a while my, my daughter will mention, you know, that she wants to be a reporter like mommy. I want them to do whatever they want to do. You know, I will support them no matter what. It's not as glamorous as I think people tend to believe, and that's something also that I try to remind the interns that uh, seek advice from me. Mm. You know, it's you're out in the cold, standing in the mud. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure you'll give your children the reality check, they'll hear about it at the dinner table, and as you said, they'll, they'll make their decisions, oh, right? Almost certainly, yeah, 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 definitely. Now, I wanted to ask you about uh, your homeland, the devastation in, in the Philippines mm. and, and that story, because um, we heard a lot about it initially when the typhoon hit and, mm -hmm. and you know, 
thousands of people lost their lives and, and at least 12 million affected by it. Mm. And here we are weeks later when we're taping this and we don't hear as much anymore. Is there a lack of, of coverage of that story and others that are similar just because they're not based in this country? And uh, if so, what should be done I, I about it? I think that that you do have a valid point there. Um, it's easy to forget when it's not right in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to forget. Unlike Sandy, Sandy was in our face, and it was in our backyard. And for some people, it was in their front yard. I mean, it was it, it was a reality that we couldn't ignore. Having this devastation overseas, there's an ocean that separates us. Not that it makes it right. It doesn't make it right, but it's, I do get it. I get it. Um, however, it's our job as um, people in the newsroom to, to still fight for those stories to be made. When the hurricane took place, I wanted to be there. I wa it, right after the devastation hit, I, it was a weekend, and I said, don't answer this until you hear me out, I think was, the was my title. And it was to my news director, my assistant news director, and my assignment manager. And I just said, here's my idea. Can we try to make this work? Well, we just couldn't. We didn't have the resources to do it. There was, you know, the, the airport was devastated. There was one runway, I believe, that planes were landing on in right. this area. And people were trying to escape yeah. from, was it Takaman? Yeah, uh, and it, yeah. it was only military planes. Right. And it was the Philippine military right. that could only land there. So um, I fought, and I fought, and I fought. And that was one battle that I didn't win. Mm -hmm at that time, however, I do still want to get there. And after the new year, um, if my boss is listening, <laughs> I do plan to revisit this. And I, okay. I, I want to good. get there, no, that's good. you know, okay. and hopefully at that time, transportation, you know, will, will be easier. Mm -hmm. Security will be better. Security was a big issue as well. They were like, we can't send you there and not have somebody mm -hmm. looking after you. And, and you'll not probably get more of a complete picture now as to the extent of it, yes. because you know when it initially happens, you get bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we had the release of the 911 tapes mm. from Sandy Hook Elementary School, and you tweeted that you really didn't want to listen mm. to those tapes. And there's kind of been a debate among journalists, like you know, your station didn't run excerpts of the tape. Yeah but I believe the CBS network did, and it, it really varied station to station, mm -hmm. network to network. How difficult a decision is that for journalists, and, and what should our criteria be? I'm a firm believer that um, we need to have access to information and to records, um, but I'm also, I mean, I, I get so sentimental when we start talking about Sandy Hook. Um, Sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. I, you know, I, you were there. Oh, it was. You saw was, the families. Yeah. You saw the the survivors and so on. So yeah, it's, it was, it's hard not to to remember. That was um, definitely um, uh, an assignment that you ca you could not help, you know, but be affected and by. As a, you know, and as a mother. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. getting there on scene, there was like this heaviness in the air, you know, that you that I really can't explain and you had to be there to feel it. And um, that was one of the few times that you couldn't help but show emotion. You know, you, 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 show, you couldn't hold back. It was hard to put up that wall, you know, which you become good at <laughs> after a few years. But going, getting back to the tapes, um, I believe that we have the right to have access to them. But I also believe that we have, as journalists, the responsibility to determine whether or not it is for the good of the public if we should air this on, on our platform. Is it necessary? Will it benefit them in any way? My opinion is no. It had no benefit. And thankfully, this day and age, if there was somebody that really wanted to hear these tapes, there are other ways that they can get access to it. And I feel as though I can sleep
better at night and I'm very comfortable and I'm proud of our, my station's decision not to air those tapes. Mm -hmm. It's just not necessary. Now, the use of social media kind of spins off some of this and the fact that it's now an important tool for a lot of reporters and you tweet a lot and mm. uh, some of it is, is very entertaining. Some of it's a little personal, some of it's professional. Yeah. How do you decide on your use of social media and what, what role should it play in mm -hmm. what you're doing? I was hesitant. I, I was originally on Twitter a few years ago and um, to be honest, I just got a little spooked by the whole thing. <laughs> you know, people, um, pe there are people out there that tend to blur the line and they don't understand that they know you on a professional level, not on a personal level. Um, this time around, you know, it, it's, it was a station um, organized effort. You know, it, it's a reality. This is the world that we live in. And you have to be part of this platform to, you know, be in touch with your viewers and to spread information and to hopefully keep viewers, you know, tuning into your station. It, it's, it's just what it is. It is what it is. Um, so this time around, you know, I, I, I feel as though my main reason for being on Twitter is obviously to talk about the stories that we're covering and spread information that is helpful to our viewers. But I also understand that they want to know us. And there are times during the newscast that maybe I will feel a little hesitant to say something that might be a little funny or, you know, quirky. So it's your other side. So your, I can do yeah. it on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> good to know. Another well, platform. I, think, I think you're going to pick up a few extra followers after this. Yeah. So it, it's fun. It is fun. And I mean, I, I have no regrets getting back on it. It drives my husband a little nuts, but I have to tell him that it's part of my job. Um, the Internet has, has changed our lives. It's changed what we, what we do as journalists and, and sources of information. One of the things that a lot of journalists tell me is that they're concerned about the rush to be first mm. because of the Internet mm -hmm. and Twitter and Facebook rather than making sure that we're right. What's, what's your view of that situation? We recently had a visit from Scott Pelley, our evening news anchor, into our newsroom. And I'm not going to quote him exactly, but he basically just said, if um, Edward R. Murrow was tweeting today, he would make sure that the information was right. And it's true. Um, everyone is, you know, they're, they're sent happy. They're, they're, you know, they're so, it's so easy to do. And um, I feel as though there are bloggers out there. Um, there are some just, you know, news media fans, newsies, you know, so to speak, um, that feel as though it's, it, it, they don't quite have the understanding that what they write down can be seen by millions of people and believed and assumed to be truth by millions of people. Um, there was a recent incident at the mall, with the mall shooting at the Garden State Plaza. Yes. Yes. And I was monitoring the Twitter feeds and they were saying that there were, you know, people shot and victims and this and that. And I kept asking my assignment editor, and I just said, is this true? Because, you know, I, if it's true, I want to tweet it. And they were like, no, there's no victims, there's no, nothing. And I even contacted a source of mine in Bergen County, and I said, are there victims? What's happening here? And he said, none so far. And so I got on Twitter, and I said, despite what other people are saying right now, there are no confirmed victims in this mall shooting. And it's just, you have to be reminded of it. Um, it's, I'm not saying that people don't make mistakes. I make mistakes. But it's a responsibility that you have to remember that, you know, people believe my word sometimes as if it was the gospel, you know? And it, it's, it's a huge responsibility, but it's one that I knew about getting into this. Now, we, now we can't finish up this discussion without talking about the talk. Because <laughs> you've been on the talk for CBS. <laughs> And um, tell us about that experience, because that's a departure, because you yeah. get to be more opinionated, and yeah. you're with uh, quite a gang there, right? Yeah, that's one of the perks um, of my job. And that, it, it's always fun to experience um, something different, 
mm -hmm. you know, it, to get you out of the newsroom and get you in front of a different audience, and to show that there is another side of you, you know, mm -hmm. that you can talk off script, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but it, it's, I can't, I don't know, it, there's no words. It was, I was giddy, I was excited. You know, I'm sitting next to Sharon Osbourne, for goodness sakes, you know, when does that <laughs> Well, she's certainly happen? opinionated, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's, um, it's an opportunity that I know I wouldn't have had otherwise, and I'm grateful for those opportunities. And it's exciting. It, it keeps me going um, when I get back to New York after those shoots to, um, you know, to keep uh, to keep persevering and and be proud of our work and what I do there. And you recently uh, taped an episode of The Crazy Ones, a sitcom <laughs> with Robin Williams. How crazy is he? <laughs> <laughs> He's nutty as an actor. I will say, when the camera is on and we are shooting scenes, mm -hmm. he is mesmerizing to watch. Mm -hmm. But off camera, when he's talking, just you know, in in general, he is so soft spoken. Um, he is very um, down to earth. No, you know, big attitude um, walking into a room. So it's um, again, it was one of those little golden nuggets that you know I'm but giving not, everyone. You're not going to desert us for acting right away. Right? Uh, no, I played a newscaster. All it right. Wasn't as <laughs> so you're being typecast. Is that what you're telling us? I, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have to stretch my or you know stretch yeah, my wings yeah. too far, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> Just a, you know, we just have a few seconds left, but um, where is TV news going? Where are we going to be in five years? Oh my is goodness! Is it still going to be as dominant as it is? Are we shifting to the internet? Are you going to be doing webcasts? What do you What do you think? Just a couple of quick predictions. Um, I think TV will definitely be around. It's not mm -hmm. going to disappear in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. I won't let it disappear in our lifetime. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean the web is obviously a a, um, a, a factor, and it's a reality. And we'll, you know, we'll learn to, we'll learn to, to take value in that, in that aspect as well. But for now, um, I still am very thankful for the people that do tune into my newscasts and um, the people that uh, allow me to do what I do every day. It's a very fulfilling job. Well, congratulations and, and thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure to meet you. It really is. So. My pleasure mm -hmm. as well. And thank you for joining us as well. For more information on this or any edition of Carpe Diem, Contact us at carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu or call 973-655-5158. I'm Mark Rosenweig for all of us at Montclair State University. Thanks for watching Carpe Diem.